her master's is from Northeastern University. Um, before she came to us in 2009 uh, as our curator, Kathleen worked for some lesser known places like the Old Mance in Concord, uh, Gore Place, Governor Gore's house in, in uh, Waltham, um, and yes, she worked for five years at Mount Auburn Cemetery. So uh, you can rest assured that she is highly qualified uh, to uh, discuss basically the famous Wellesley folks who are buried at Mount Auburn. Um, by the way, Kathleen has also written several uh, articles on Mount Auburn Cemetery, and as many of you know from first-hand experience, she has three times this lecture series in the last several years spoken on what we call Wellesley Then and Now, which is kind of an architectural slash historical tour of uh, key neighborhoods in our town. So anyway, with no further introduction, I give you Kathleen Fahey. Good afternoon, everyone. Everybody hear me in the back? Yes. We good? Excellent. Okay. So I'm really excited to be here um, with you today talking about Mount Auburn Cemetery. As John mentioned, um, I've been with Wellesley now for almost eight years. Um, but many moons ago, about 20 years ago, when I graduated from graduate school, uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery was my first job out of school. And I worked there for six years, and it was such a beautiful place to work. And ever since I've been at, Mount, um, at Wellesley, I've been trying to find ways to find connections between the two. And I was so happy to find out that several people, Wellesley residents, are buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery. Uh, now, this is not an easy task. If you go to Mount Auburn Cemetery and say, who is buried in Mount Auburn Cemetery from Wellesley, they say, we don't know. Um, they just have a database that goes by the people's names. So literally, I was just there working with their database, just plugging in as many famous names as I could think of, and counting on different people to tell me that they knew uh, people were buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery. And one of the first ones I noticed as I was walking through the cemetery after I started at Wellesley was H.H. H. Honeywell, and he has a really beautiful side hill tomb. And that's really what inspired me and got this lecture going, was seeing that um, monument at Mount Auburn Cemetery. But if after this lecture you know of somebody that um, was a Wellesley resident that was buried in Mount Auburn Cemetery, I'd love to hear from you um, for a future tour or lectures about Mount Auburn Cemetery. So we're going to start here today with just... Um, a background about the history of Mount Auburn Cemetery, just so you can understand the context. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what cemeteries were like before Mount Auburn Cemetery. Mount Auburn Cemetery was founded in 1831 as the nation's first rural garden cemetery. Now before that, cemeteries, um, they didn't actually even use the word cemetery. That was a new use of the word. Uh, before that, they were called graveyards or burial yards, and they were usually pretty bleak. Um, overcrowding was a problem. They were usually un unkempt, and there were also concerns about illness spreading from the graveyards. Um, these are the three, three of the existing graveyards in Boston at the time. You can see Cox Hill, King's Chapel, and the Granary Burying Ground. Um, now, as early as the 1730s, these Boston graveyards were already overcrowded. New burials were, had to be done four deep, and burials often took place in common trenches. Um, they were often unkempt as well. The burial grounds were often used for grazing for the livestock. There was usually no plantings, no trees, and they were generally neglected. Um, now, this was not just a problem in Boston. This was a problem all over the United States. Um, a visitor to George Washington's tomb from England in 1932 wrote about what bad shape Washington's tomb was in. They said, quote, the grounds are laid out in a tasteless style and kept in a slovenly manner, a high coarse grass growing up to the very door. Um, so this was a widespread problem. And to solve that problem, um, a local doctor named Jacob Bigelow um, worked with the city of Boston because it's important to note that Mount Auburn Cemetery, even though it's located in Cambridge, it was the cemetery for the city of Boston. It was intended that way, and placing it outside of the town line helped them to deal with the space issues that were, they were having inside of Boston. Um, so physician Jacob Bigelow um, worked with the um, city of Boston 
and also Mass Horticultural Society to create a new cemetery for the city of Boston outside the city lines. They chose a farm in Cambridge that was about four miles outside of the city, and the area that they chose was known as Sweet Auburn by the local Harvard students who liked to walk through that area. Um, the cemetery started, Mount Auburn Cemetery started as 72 acres, and it's developed to 170 acres over time. Now, here on the top, you're seeing a slide of Mount Auburn Cemetery as it was originally designed. The map is from 1841, but the cemetery was founded in 1831, and it looked pretty much the same as it did in 1831, as you see here in 1841. Um, now, what Jacob Bigelow wanted to do, as well as Mass Horticultural Society, is they wanted to create a beautiful, picturesque landscape. They didn't want to have a bleak graveyard um, with lines of slate headstones in a row. Um, they wanted to use the natural landscape, and they wanted to enhance that natural landscape to create what would be called a picturesque landscape at that time period. Um, there was rolling hills, winding roads. Um, and they really tried to follow the natural contours of the land. You can see that there were some water features. Um, these two right here are both lakes here. And you can see, I'm sorry if, it's a, if the slide is a little light, but the roads, can you see how the roads are sort of in a serpentine fashion, following the hills and the natural contours of the land? Um, now, this was actually designed by the president of Mass Horticultural Society, Henry A.S. Dearborn. And it is important to note that the cemetery was essentially founded by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society, which was also a very new organization. They had just started in 1829, um, and they played a big part in the founding of the cemetery in 1831. Uh, but the cemetery and Mass Horticultural Society did part ways within a couple years, and then Mount Auburn Cemetery was an independent nonprofit organization on its own. Um, now, one of the most frequent questions that I got from people coming to Mount Auburn Cemetery when I was working there was, was this designed by Olmsted? Uh, because many of you are familiar with the Emerald Necklace here in Boston, and of course, Central Park is probably Olmsted's. Um, most notable um, design. And what's really interesting to note is that this Mount Auburn was designed really a generation before Olmsted. Um, Olmsted was actually only nine years old when the cemetery was founded in 1831. Um, so I hope by seeing that it's done a whole generation before Olmsted, you can see how this was really on the cutting edge and just really completely new and different. And because of this, this was actually a tourist attraction. Just like um, Central Park would become a tourist attraction, Mount Auburn Cemetery was a tourist attraction as early as the 1830s. And let's take a look at why it would have been so popular and would have been a tourist attraction. Um, one of the ideas that they founded Mount Auburn Cemetery on, and this was a revolutionary concept, they wanted to commemorate the dead as well as to comfort the living. Um, graveyards before that had simply been just areas to inter, um, inter people. But Mount Auburn Cemetery was also meant for the people who were living. So up here you can see an image from 1852. This is what um, the image is calling it the Plymouth Gothic Burying Grounds. Um, and this appeared in Gleason's Pictorial in 1852. And you can see just sort of how bleak this is. It's just a flat space. These slate monuments, some of them are crooked. And it doesn't look terribly pleasant. But look down here at Mount Auburn Cemetery. Mount Auburn Cemetery is popping up in all of the um, magazines, periodicals, and newspapers of the day. And these images are being disseminated to the public. So over here in 1847, there was a whole series, um, a book called Rural Cemeteries of America, and these images of Mount Auburn Cemetery were published. Take a look at this. This is beautiful. Look at all the trees. Look at the lovely um, marble monument there and the fencing. And look, this is a place you can bring your kids to, okay? So not only is it beautiful, but it's also safe. They're not worrying about 
Um, they didn't really understand the germ theory of disease. They thought diseases might be given off by bad air or miasma that was rising from these overcrowded burial grounds. So because things are so spread out and the burials are not happening in trenches, they're not worried about any miasma coming up. So it's certainly a place you can bring the kids to. Over here in 1872, you can bring the kids to feed the ducks in one of the ponds there. They've got a beautiful um, fountain there, and you can see this is a side hill tomb right here. But you can see all these people. There's people just sitting on the grass there. Um, and this was really an amazing new concept um, in cemetery design. And this was so popular that these popped up all over the place. They popped up all around Massachusetts and all over the United States. So you, if you've ever been to a cemetery that looks like Mount Auburn, it's really been patterned after Mount Auburn. And Mount Auburn was really the first and the original. So now one of the first questions I asked myself, and you're probably wondering too, is why Mount Auburn Cemetery? If you live in Wellesley and you have several burial grounds available to you here in Wellesley, we've got the Congregational Burial Ground in town, you've got um, St. Mary's over in Lower Falls. In the later years, you have Woodlawn Cemetery. Why would you go to Mount Auburn Cemetery? Um, and so there's a variety of reasons why people would choose Mount Auburn. Um, probably the biggest one is because they might have been also Boston residents. Um, so I mentioned earlier that Mount Auburn Cemetery was considered the cemetery for the town, uh, excuse me, for the city of Boston. And a lot of Wellesley residents actually had um, winter addresses in Boston. So they would spend the winter in Boston and go to the different plays and the different things that would be going on in Boston. But then if you can imagine how hot and smelly Boston would be in the summer, people would escape to the country. And um, Wellesley was one of those country spots that Boston residents would escape to. They would set up summer homes here. Um, sometimes they would decide to move out here entirely, bring their family out here to live, and then maybe commute into Boston um, for their job because we have the railroad as early as the 1830s, 35. Um, so a lot of the Wellesley residents that I'm going to be talking about today may have I also identified as Boston residents. The next reason why several of them, I believe, are buried here is because of the connections to the Mass Horticultural Society. Um, as I mentioned, the cemetery was originally founded by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. And even though they split off, there were still connections over the years. And one of the things that they did inside the cemetery is they planted a lot of new and experimental trees. When it was first founded as a cemetery, they also put in an experimental arboretum in Mount Auburn Cemetery. Um, that was part of the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. So there were a lot of beautiful tree specimens there that you wouldn't have been able to see anywhere else. Another reason why people would go to Mount Auburn Cemetery or be buried there is because it was so popular. Here you see Dearborn's Guide through Mount Auburn Cemetery from 1851. So there's really this general knowledge um, through society about Mount Auburn Cemetery. If you're not buried there, you could go and visit um, and use a pamphlet like this to help guide you on a tour through Mount Auburn Cemetery, sort of like a self-guided walking tour. Um, the other thing to note is that there was ready transportation to Mount Auburn Cemetery. Um, this image here is of the um, horse-drawn railway that would leave out of um, Harvard Square and go out to Mount Auburn Cemetery. And I apologize, it's a little blurry, but this horse cart right here actually says Mount Auburn on it right there. And then it says Cambridge, Boston. Um, so it was a stop on that street railway. It was also a stop on the um, train station as well. The Fitchburg railway line had a stop nearby. And if you had a horse-drawn carriage, there were lots of stables nearby. And they also had, um, for the comfort of visitors, they also had a well house where you could stop and get um, refreshment. And they also had a reception house um, that had bathroom facilities in it. Um, so they made it really easy 
um, to get to Mount Auburn, um, even if you are coming from a long distance like Wellesley. And then again, just to show you the popularity of Mount Auburn Cemetery, um, when I was the assistant curator, curator at Mount Auburn Cemetery, I was responsible for the artwork, the sculpture, um, the ecclesiastical collections, um, the iron fences outside, the planters, all of those different sort of objects. And this is one of the objects that I was responsible for caring for. And um, this is essentially uh, candlesticks, but the, um, the official term for it is girondoles. And we had these beautiful Mount Auburn Cemetery um, girondoles that we were able to acquire. And um, this is an image of Bigelow Chapel. There's two chapels at Mount Auburn Cemetery. And so these were available um, for mass consumption. If you go into a Skinner catalog, you'll see these every couple of years being auctioned off. Um, so people could have a little bit of Mount Auburn Cemetery in their house with them. I've also seen teacups with an image of Mount Auburn Cemetery on it with the transfer printed where. Um, so it was just really a general um, part of American culture at that time period. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take a walk through Mount Auburn Cemetery. This is a more modern map and um, right here is Mount Auburn Street and this is where the main um, entrance is and that address is in Cambridge but other parts of the cemetery over here are actually on the Watertown line. Now this shows the cemetery at about 170 acres today. The old part of the cemetery is more this area right here. If, we, if I was to pull up that older map it would be right about here. So we're going to stick to the older sections of Mount Auburn Cemetery. And um, just to make it a little bit more fun, I've got fun facts interspersed in here because we can't talk about a cemetery for an hour um, <laughs> without it getting a little bit too serious. So um, we're going we're gonna to keep it light. I'm going to have some fun facts for you. And hopefully, um, I put the fun facts in there because this is some of the knowledge that I've gained over the years of working there that helps me to read the landscape. And I sort of want to teach you how to read the landscape at Mount Auburn Cemetery as well. And I should also mention that I'm going to offer a tour of Mount Auburn Cemetery for um, the Wellesley Historical Society in 2018. So if this has piqued your interest, you can join me next year um, and we'll go and take a look at some of these things in person and learn more. So my first fun fact here is that um, lots at Mount Auburn Cemetery were sold as family lots. If you go to a cemetery today, you might buy one plot that's too deep, and you might think about burying two people there, or you might buy two, buy two side by side where you can marry four people. Um, but at, Mount, at the time that this was created in 1831, these were intended to be family burial sites. And the whole family, many generations, were expected to be buried there. And these were really like an extension of your home, and people decorated them as such. You can see the fencing that they would put around their lots there, the curbing, um, or if you had a side hill tomb right here, um, you might decorate it with some urns there. And so people were actually responsible for the maintenance of their own lots in the early years. Um, so you would come in and you would cut the grass inside your own lot and you could decorate it as such. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that as we're talking about these different lots, they really are considered family lots, um, not necessarily single lots. So the first people that we're going to talk about today are Benjamin Cheney and Alice Cheney Baltzell. Um, has anybody heard of them before? A couple of you have, that's great. I wasn't sure if people were going to be as familiar with the Cheneys. Um, so the Cheney family owned Elm Bank, which is right on the edge of Dover. The street address is 900 Washington. Um, so it is within Wellesley, and the Cheney and Baltzells definitely identified as Wellesley residents. Um, now, Benjamin Pierce Cheney, who's pictured right here, he purchased the estate in the 1870s and built a Victorian estate and Victorian gardens. Um, and he was one of the founders of a, patch, a package express delivery company that would later become American Express. Um, he died in 1894, and about 10 years later, 
Alice acquired the, um, the family estate from the uh, remaining members of the family. And um, after she acquires the state in, estate in 1904, she marries William Baltzell in 1907. And she just decides to really start fresh. She takes everything down. She takes out the Victorian house that her father built. She took out the Victorian gardens. And she decided to put up this beautiful Georgian Revival house that is still there today and is owned by Mass Horticultural Society. Um, when the house was built in 1911, this was newsworthy, um, and the townsman of November 24th, 1911 says, quote, Dr. and Mrs. William H. Baltzell are again at Elm Bank, their handsome estate at Wellesley. The house, which has only been completed with the past year, is of Georgian architecture. Surrounding it are 50 acres of lawn with ferneries, rose gardens, and hothouses, making it one of the show places of the neighborhood. Um, and they didn't just stop there. They also contracted with the Olmsted Brothers firm to create an Italian garden on the site, which is also still there today. Um, now, when Alice died in 1938, she and William actually died um, with no heirs. So this Elm Bank went through a series of owners over the years. Uh, but I think we're really fortunate that the Mass Horticultural Society actually decided to purchase this estate and move out to this location. Uh, Mass Horticultural Society doesn't actually own the whole thing. I'm sure if you've been down there, you've seen the kids out playing soccer. Um, a good percentage of it, too, is also called the Elm Bank Reservation. So let's take a look at their burial site at Mount Auburn Cemetery. They're on Fir Ave in lot 2030. And um, right here, this temple is Benjamin Cheney's um, resting place. Um, he actually purchased this lot in 1876. He bought it pre-need before he needed it. And um, this was a great um, location for him at Mount Auburn Cemetery because Benjamin Cheney was actually very active in the Mass Horticultural Society. Um, he um, was on their board for many years and he was also a Boston resident and so Wellesley was his summer address. So again, why is he being buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery? Probably because of the Mass Court connections and also because of the Boston connections. Um, Benjamin Cheney is buried with his wife, Elizabeth, inside that little temple there. And then Alice Balt, uh, Cheney Baltzell is buried right there. Her husband actually predeceased her in 1928, and she had these, um, it's hard to tell because um, they have some biological growth on them, but this, this is actually pink Tennessee um, granite that these monuments are made of there. Um, and so she was um, interred there in 1938. And, um, and then one of her brothers is over here. And what I love about, one of the things I love about Mount Auburn Cemetery is that there's something for everyone. If you're a birder, if you're interested in history, whatever you're interested in, you can always find something at Mount Auburn Cemetery. And for architecture buffs, um, some of these monuments that are mimicking um, larger architectural buildings are a lot of fun. There's a lot of architectural elements at Mount Auburn Cemetery, and I'll show you some more of those later. So for our next fun fact, I wanted to explain um, what the lot number and the street address mean. Um, just like I mentioned earlier, these lots were like extensions of your home. They also had addresses um, to them, just like your house would. So we saw the vault cells were at lot 2030, um, I believe, on Fur Ave. And what that means is that they were the two, that was the 2030th lot to be sold at Mount Auburn Cemetery. So on Fur Ave, you could have lot number 3, 2030, and number 18 all next to each other. The numbers go in sequential order in which they were sold. So it's a little different from your street address at home, which is sequential on the actual street. Um, so here's another example. This is lot 1967 on Willow Avenue, and the owner is Charles Smith. And you can see in his 
granite curving right there, he's actually put the number right on there for you and his name. So it's just like you put your number on your house. A lot of times they put the numbers on their lots as well. Now the streets, um, the street names are mainly taken from plants and trees in the older section, and the newer sections of the cemetery tend to have bird names to them. What I really like are these old cast iron street signs that they still have. Uh, many of these are original. Um, some of them have broken over the years, and they painstakingly restore these um, in-house at the cemetery and replace them with exact replicas over the years. Um, so it's really quite beautiful to see these through the cemetery. Let's take a look at our next stop on our tour, and we're going to talk about uh, William Morton. I've spoken about him in one of my then and now lectures, so I was really excited to find out that he was buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery. There's a picture of him down at the bottom here, and William Morton was the first person to publicly demonstrate the use of ether for anesthesia during surgery. This took place at Mass General Hospital, on October 16, in 1846, and at Mass General Hospital, they still celebrate Ether Day every year <laughs> on that date. Um, now, William Morton was not a physician, he was actually a dentist, and he wanted to relieve his patients of their discomfort from having teeth pulled, so that's why he developed anesthesia. And here's a great painting of that moment in time. It was done many years after the fact. Um, the painting was commissioned in the 1880s, and here is um, Dr. Morton right there administering the anesthesia, and there is his um, friend, Henry Jacob Bigelow, the son of one of the founders of Mount Auburn Cemetery, and um, friends and colleagues with Dr. Morton. And just to remind you where Dr. Morton lived, he lived at the location of where the town hall is today. His little Gothic college, cottage was called Etherton, and quite appropriate. So let's take a look at his um, burial site here. Now, what's really interesting is that there was a controversy at the time over who discovered the use of anesthesia. There were at least three people claiming that they were the ones who discovered it. Uh, Mass General Hospital, um, of course, backed uh, Dr. Morton because he did the demonstration at their location. And so a lot of Mass General Hospital doctors and his friends all supported him as the um, first person to do it, but unfortunately he didn't receive any um, financial compensation and he actually died um, being very much in debt in town. So because he died in debt um, in 1868, his widow didn't have any money to bury him. Um, so he was very fortunate that his friend, um, Dr. Henry Jacob Bigelow, um, got a group of people together and they actually bought this burial lot um, at Mount Auburn Cemetery for um, William Morton, and they had this, um, this monument erected as well. And the front of the monument reads, William T.G. Morton, inventor and revealer of anesthetic inhalation, born August 9, 1819, died July 15, 1868, erected by the citizens of Boston. And then there's some words written um, on each panel as you walk around the monument, and they say, before whom in all time surgery was agony, by whom pain and surgery was arrested and annulled, since whom science has control of pain. Um, now what's really interesting about um, this burial site is um, the, the, the timeline, I would say, in which things happened. Um, so what you're seeing here is from the Mount Auburn Cemetery archives. These are called lot cards. This is how the cemetery pre-computers um, would keep track of what was going on in the lots and who was buried there. Um, so you can see here we've got lot 3940 on Spruce Ave. It was owned by Elizabeth Morton because she was, it was gifted to her. And then we have the list of the burials here. And then M is for monument, so you can see um, the different monuments that are here. No, I'm sorry, M is for marble. Um, if this was a granite monument, it would have a G on it. Um, now down here, we can see a note, number one from RT, 
um, November 18, 1869. So number one refers to William Morton's burial. And RT means receiving tomb. So what's happening here um, is that William Morton died on July 15, 1868 in New York City. He was brought to Mount Auburn Cemetery on September 7, 1868 and placed in the receiving tomb. And then on November 13, 1869, he was finally placed in the lot. Um, so receiving tombs, I'm going to talk a little bit more about them later in the lecture, but a receiving tomb was a tomb that the cemetery ran that was available for people whose arrangements had not been made yet and they were not ready to have the body interred. It, the receiving tomb was vital in the winter. They could not dig the graves in the winter because the ground was frozen. So if you died in the winter, you were going to the receiving tomb until the ground thawed out and you could be buried in your lot. Um, so it's not, it's not unusual to me that he went to the receiving tomb first in September. Maybe the lot wasn't ready yet. We don't know. But what's really interesting to me is where was the body from July 15th to September 7th? And we really don't know. Uh, we don't know where he was kept, and there's nothing in Mount Auburn Cemetery's archives about this. Um, so it's sort of interesting. This is sort of a tangent you know, that I'd like to go off on some point and see if maybe he was placed in a receiving tomb in Wellesley while they were waiting to decide what to do. But that's just sort of a little history mystery for you right there. Okay, so another fun fact. I don't know how fun, are these fun? <laughs> I don't know. I, this is a fun font, right? So I'm trying to make it fun. Um, this is the receiving tomb, the cemetery's receiving tomb on Greenbrier Path. It still exists today, although it's not in use. The cemetery did have two receiving tombs, as I mentioned, in the winter. That's where all the, um, the remains were going until the, until the ground thawed out. Um, and I've said the word side hill tomb a couple times, and I want to explain to you a side hill tomb is one that is sort of um, built into a hill or has a mound of earth over it. So you see here, this is a side hill tomb. This is a mausoleum. A mausoleum has four walls and a roof. And they often incorporate stained glass into the mausoleums. So if you were to look through this door right here, this is the door frame. You see into it, there's stained glass at the back of this mausoleum right here. Um, and the stained glass is quite beautiful. One of, the, one of my jobs at the cemetery was to actually go into all of the mausoleums and catalog all of the stained glass. So um, I had, a, you know, I had one of the workers with me, and he'd go in and he'd sweep out all the spiders first for me to go in. And and I actually had to, I actually was in, I was in that, I was in all the mausoleums that had stained glass. So that was an interesting, interesting part of my job. Um, but this, the stained glass in there is really historically significant. Um, so it had to be done with permission from the families, of course. And then um, the last type of burial that I want to talk about is a cenotaph. And a cenotaph can be any shape, any size. The reason why it's, a cen it's called a cenotaph is because the person that's memorialized on the stone is not actually interred there. So, for example, this one says that this person was buried at sea. Um, so a cenotaph would be a monument for somebody who's not actually interred there. Okay, the next stop on our tour is H.H. H. Honeywell's tomb. Um, A.J. Tunnewell was, of course, the benefactor of our town. Our town was named after his estate, Wellesley. Um, he built the town hall, oh, excuse me, he built the town hall and the library for us and gifted us um, these buildings along with the land and the parkland. Um, here's a picture of him with his family down there. Um, and what I learned about A.J. Tunnewell through doing this research is that he didn't just make the big donations that we all know about. He made a lot of smaller, more anonymous donations. And I was really struck by um, a eulogy that I read that was written by the Board of Selectmen in Wellesley um, when he died in 1902. He explained that, quote, when leaving here for his winter home, he would go to our old town clerk, Solomon Flagg, and say to him, quote, be sure and not allow anyone to suffer during the cold weather. Send them whatever they need and I will pay the bill. Mr. Honeywell and Mr. Flagg were the only ones that knew from whence the helping hand came. So here is his um, family lot, 
And again, this is what first struck me. Um, walking by it, it's hard to miss because it's in really big writing right here. Horatio Hollis Hunnewell, and he actually overlooks Consecration Dell, which is a small wetland area. And I go down there um, with my, I used to go down there with my kids all the time when they were younger. When my daughter said this, she said, oh, this is where the frogs are. I said, yeah, this is, this is where we go look for the frogs. Um, so he actually, the family has quite a large lot right here. It encompasses both of these monuments there. Um, and it is at the corner of Iris and Ivy Paths. And it was purchased in 1869 by H.H. H. Honeywell, um, pre-need. And Mount Auburn Cemetery was a natural choice for somebody like Honeywell. He was a Boston resident, um, summered out here in Wellesley. He was an active member of the Mass Horticultural Society. He was a Harvard grad, probably walked through Sweet Auburn, um, grew up in Watertown. Um, so it's, it's, it's not surprising that he's buried there to me. Now the side hill tomb that you see here was put in in 1902. It's made of granite with a marble door. And there's plenty of room for the family in here. There's actually 30 crypts for interments and also areas for uh, niches uh, for um, cremated remains. This was actually designed, this side hill tomb was designed by the architects Shaw and Honeywell. Shaw and Honeywell um, were the architects of the town hall because Shaw um, was H.H. H. Honeywell, I'm sorry, Honeywell was H.H. H. Honeywell's son. So his son designed the town hall as well as the family um, burial side hill tomb there. Um, again, I, this is a beautiful location. And the day that I went to take the pictures, all of these rhododendrons were in bloom all around Consecration Dell. And what I also found out in my research is that H.H. H. Honeywell was one of the first people to cultivate and popularize rhododendrons in the United States. Um, so it's sort of this ubiquitous shrub that we all have in front of our houses now, but at the time it was quite exotic, and H.H. H. Honeywell helped to cu cultivate them and um, bring them into um, our community. Now, the, the memorial service, um, when H.H. H. Honeywell died, the memorial service actually took place at the mansion, and then the family drove onto Mount Auburn Cemetery. His grandson wrote about it and said, quote, he was buried in the family vault at Mount Auburn Cemetery, Cambridge. His whole family driving to the cemetery to pay their last respects to him, who had truly been, for so many years, a loving and dev devoted father to them all. He was laid at rest, surrounded by the many descendants and friends he loved so well. Now, even though there's space for 30 interments, over time, um, this area was filled up. So the family put in this monument um, in 1975 um, for more recent burials. Now, I think H.H. H. Honeywell would have appreciated this fun fact because he was very interested in horticulture. And what's really fun is that all of the trees have tags on them at Mount Auburn Cemetery. So whenever you're curious about what kind of tree it is or when it was planted, you can go and take a look at these tags. Some have these sort of tags, and then other of them have um, just these sort of credit card tags on them. Um, it looks like a credit card, but it has all the information on it. And you can really get used to this. After working at Mount Auburn Cemetery for six years, I felt like every tree in the world should have a tag on it. You know, I'd just be walking down my neighborhood and say, what kind of tree is that? I think I'll go look for the tag. And then I'd have to remind myself, not every tree is tagged in this world. Um, but it's a lot of fun. If you want to learn more about trees, this is a really easy way to do it, is to go there, walk around, and take a look at these tags. The next people we're going to talk about um, are Gamaliel and Helen Ford Bradford. Now, is Dwin Schuler in the audience? Okay, so we have to thank Dwin and John for me getting the pronunciation right on this. When I very first started at Mount Auburn Cemetery, I was talking to Dwin about Gamaliel Bradford. I don't know what crazy pronunciation I had come up, and Dwin had to stay with me for a good five minutes and keep on saying Gamaliel, Gamaliel, and I'd have to repeat it after her. It was like my fair lady. So I finally, I finally got it right, and... It is Camilio Bradford, um, and he was really well-loved by the town. Um, we don't hear a lot about him today. Um, a lot of you probably remember the high school that was named after him for many years, 
Um, so it was really interesting to learn more about him and his wife, Helen Ford Bradford. Um, she was a charter member of the Wellesley Hills Women's Club. And I know we have some members in here today. And she actually wrote the club history. And we're so fortunate that the Wellesley Hills Women's Club donated their archives to us at the, at the Wellesley Historical Society. So those archives will be safe there. And we have many copies of Helen Ford Bradford's book in that archives as well. Um, now, Gamaliel Bradford was always um, suffering from ill health, but he still had a full life. Um, they had a family, they had two kids, he had a career as a writer. He wrote over 100 biographies, and this is what he was really well known for, were these biographies that he called psychographs. And he called them psychographs because he focused on the person's personal motivation and their psychology. Well, any biography you read today delves right into that, but he was the first one. He's sort of, you know, the father of the um, modern American biography. Biographies before this just sort of listed events and didn't really contextualize them um, in terms of the person's um, experiences and their personality. So he was the first person to do that, so we have him to thank for that. Um, his death in 1932 was front page news in the Townsend, and they described him as a distinguished bio biographer and beloved townsman. Um, he was very involved in the school board. He loved to attend the school athletic games. Um, so even though he died in 1932, it was several years later when they built the new school in 1938 on Rice Street, and they decided to name the new high school um, the Gamaliel Bradford High School. Now, despite his ill health, he did live to the age of 69. And um, he was buried in his family's um, lot at Mount Auburn Cemetery. Um, this lot was purchased in 1866 by Gamaliel Bradford, his grandfather. And um, that family was from Boston, so that's probably why they purchased the lot here. They have simple granite monuments. And he's buried with his ancestors. We've got Gamaliel Bradford, four, five, six, and then his son died young at 22. Um, so his son is buried right there next to him. Um, Gamaliel was, um, died first in 1932. He was cremated. And when Helen died in 1954, uh, it says in the Mount Auburn Cemetery archives that she specially requested that their ashes be intermingled and then reinterred. Um, so they're interred here together in this spot right here. Okay, our next slide back. These are the turtles um, that we used to visit. So I'll, I'll say this photo and this photo is a stock, these are stock photos from Mount Auburn Cemetery's website. I'm not, not getting that close to a coyote. Um, so there's so much wildlife there. It's really amazing. There's, um, this is I think a um, red-tailed hawk. This was in the tree next to me when I was there one day taking pictures. And this is a turkey that I caught at the Durant's um, lot, which we'll be looking at next. So there's lots of things going on. They even maintain hives of bees there. So it's a lot of fun. So the Durant's we're going to move on to next. Um, Henry Fowl Durant and Pauline Fowl Durant, you probably all know that they were the co-founders of Wellesley College. They married in 1854, and they lived in Boston. And in the same year, they bought a summer cottage in Wellesley that they called Homestead. Um, in 1855, their son Harry was born. And then two years later, in 1857, their daughter Pauline was born, um, but she died at the age of six weeks. Um, now, they bought almost 300 acres in Wellesley, and they hoped that this would be a great country estate for their son, Harry. Um, unfortunately, Harry died at age eight. Uh, he died of diphtheria in, in 1863. And this was really a turning point for the Durants. Um, Henry Fowl Durant left his law practice, and he decided to become a lay preacher. And within a few years um, of, of little Harry's death, they actually decided to take that 300-acre estate and start building Wellesley College. Um, and so I have a postcard from our archives of, well, of College Hall right here that burned down in uh, about 1916, so you won't see that on the grounds today. But they could actually watch College Hall being built from their home in Wellesley. 
Now, the whole family is buried here at Mount Auburn Cemetery on Osier Path. Um, this was a family lot that was actually purchased by William Durant's father way back in 1835. And you can see that's why it has a low number, 484. So that tells you when it was sold in 1835, this was the 484th lot being sold at the cemetery. Um, now, what's interesting about why they decided to be buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery, uh, number one, the family had a lot there, so it was already available. But number two, the Durants were Wellesley, I'm um, sorry, they were Boston residents, and they summered in Wellesley back when Harry was a baby. Um, Harry actually died in the Boston home. Harry did not die in Wellesley. Um, so again, this being the cemetery for the city of Boston, this was a natural choice for them. Um, now, back uh, so here's the main um, granite monument to um, Henry and Pauline Durant, the parents. And then back here, this is the tiny little monument for Pauline, little baby Pauline. And you see this a lot with the little kids. They have little tiny, little tiny monuments. It's quite sad. Harry lived to eight, so his monument's a little bit bigger. Um, but they're sort of right back here. You can't see it, but they're right in the back there. Um, so actually, that brings us to our fun fact of um, the symbolism of the cemetery. Um, actually, let me go back for a minute here. So in the Durant's lot, you can see that the kids' monuments, these were done in the 1860s, and they were done in marble, and you can see that there's carving on them. This was put in later. This was put in the 1880s. This is showing you the change in cemetery fashions, because there are fashions that go along with cemeteries. And um, so... Marble monuments would have been, were very popular early on in the cemetery's history, from the 1830s up until about the Civil War. They realized that the monuments, the mo these marble monuments were um, eroding very quickly. And so marble, be um, sorry, granite became much more popular. And so you can see this marble monument um, is in much better shape than, I keep on saying the wrong thing, the granite monument is in much better shape when you see them up close than the marble monument. Um, and talking about the different types of uh, monuments, the marble ones are easier to carve, but that's also what makes them erode faster when they're put outside like this. Um, because they're softer, you can put a lot more symbolism into them. And so for children, you see lambs a lot. And it may not look small in this picture, but this is a very this is a fairly small monument, and a little little lamb is quite common, and this is a um, you know symbolism of their innocence and allusions to Christianity and the Lamb of God. A lot of times, if you see a monument with what looks like an unformed lump of sugar, that's a lamb that's been all eroded away over time. I was just lucky to get this lamb in pretty good condition. A lot of times, you just sort of sort of see this amorphous sort of blob on the top. It's very sad. And here's little Mary. This is a tiny little, tiny little um, monument. And look at poor Mary. She's a little rosebud that's never bloomed. And it's just, it's just wilted right there. You see that a lot, the, the, the rosebud or the unbloomed flower for the children. And conversely, for the um, older folks who lived a good long life, they get a sheaf of wheat. And that's because a sheaf of wheat has gone through its complete life cycle, and it's been harvested at the correct time. So it's been, um, you know, it's been planted, it's been taken care of, it's been reaped. And this is the time when the sheaf of wheat was supposed to be harvested. So that really is symbolism for a good long life. Men and women also get different symbolism. The women get the ivy, which is a um, symbol of fidelity. And then the men often get the oak leaves um, because that's a symbol of strength. And then these people back here, you can see this has got the ivy and the sheaf of wheat. And then over here, we've got the oak and the sheaf of wheat. And without even seeing mother or father or even looking at the dates, I can immediately tell you know, which one's female, which one's male. And then I'm guessing they lived at least until their 60s, which would have been considered a good, good long um, time to live at the time that they were buried. Um, so let's move on. This is actually the last, uh, the last stop on our tour, and this is more of an honorable mention because Catherine Lee Bates and Catherine Coleman are not actually interred at the cemetery, but they were both cremated at the cemetery. 
And you can see at the bottom of the slide there, that's the house that they lived in at 70 Curve Street. Um, the owner of that house was very kind and let us visit there on one of our previous um, house tours. Um, and it's, it's quite beautiful inside. Now, um, Catherine Lee Bates and Catherine Coleman were both professors at Wellesley College. Catherine Lee Bates, I'm sure you all know, um, wrote the poem, um, America the Beautiful. And Coleman was very well known in her time as an economist. And um, they actually lived at the house there together, which could be best described in the time period as a Boston marriage. And um, <laughs> so Coleman died first in 1915 of breast cancer. And her ashes, she was cremated at Mount Auburn Cemetery, and then her ashes were um, sent back to her hometown in Ohio. And then Catherine Lee Bates died in 1929, and her ashes um, were sent back to Falmouth, where she was born. Um, and they, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. So they were both um, cremated at the Bigelow Chapel Crematory. There are two chapels um, on site at Mount Auburn Cemetery. The Bigelow Chapel um, was retrofitted. It was originally built in the 1840s, um, but in the 1890s, you see um, cremation coming into play. Um, and so in 1899, Mount Auburn Cemetery added a crematory in the basement of Bigelow Chapel, and it was the first crematory in Massachusetts and one of the first in the United States. Um, in 1970, they actually added a, a new crematory off to the side here, and it's in a little addition. But I just wanted to remind you of those girondoles of Bigelow Chapel. There they are here, and you can see they did a pretty good job there. Um, we're going to move on to our final um, fun fact. And there I am um, at Mount Auburn Cemetery, my husband Rich and um, my daughter Maisie in 2000. There I am at the tender age of 27. And it's, I don't know how we got this shot without any monuments in the background. That's, it's kind of a miracle, um, but we did. And then um, because I live in Belmont, I take my kids to Mount Auburn all the time. We, like I said, we would go frog hunting and turtle hunting, and they'd bring their sketchbooks and they'd sketch. And now um, my little Maisie right there is a senior in high school, and she um, is taking photography. So she goes over and does some of her photography lessons over there. So she thought, and I thought too, that it would be fun to have her senior portrait taken at Mount Auburn Cemetery. So, of course, most of the shots, we didn't want there to be any monuments in them. Um, but I said, to the, I said to the photographer, can we just take one shot with monuments just for fun, um, just to remember this guy? And so um, we, we got this one really beautiful shot, and there she is with her purple hair and all of her <laughs> And I'll tell you, this was the best deal I ever made, from, made with her. She wanted to color her hair when she was a freshman. I said, no, you're too young, and she just kept on going at me, going at me, going at me. And I said, okay, well, if you can get a 3.5 and keep it, I'll let you dye your hair. <laughs> so she's graduating with a 3.6. <laughs> so she's happy, I'm happy, everybody's happy. Um, and she re, -re her hair every, a couple times a year, but you know, as long as her grades are good, she gets to do it. <laughs> So that's the end of our lecture today. Um, I want to encourage you all to visit Mount Auburn Cemetery. Um, it's a tourist spot just today, just like it was in the 1830s. Um, you're welcome to go there and drive and walk through. They have lots of activities and tours planned. They have um, driving tours and walking tours. Um, stay tuned. I'll be giving a walk through Mount Auburn Cemetery in 2018 to show you some of these monuments um, up close and some other different ones as well. Um, but just some tips for visiting. They don't allow pets or food or bicycles, so no picnics. Um, and then they suggest that you park with all four wheels on the pavement. Um, so don't drive up into the grass. If you do, you get a little special Mount Auburn Cemetery parking ticket. <laughs> and it's very sweet. You don't get charged or anything. It's just a very nice little note that they leave on your windshield saying, please don't park on the grass. And then it's a very large place. You might think that you're going to get lost at some point, whether you're walking or driving. But if you follow the, the dotted green line or the solid green line, it always leads you back in a circle, back to the front gate. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so if you follow those, you won't get lost at the cemetery. So what I'd love to do now is to maybe put the lights on and answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Yes? How many varieties of trees? That's a great question. How many varieties of trees? So when I was there, I don't know the answer to that question because I was the curator of historical collections. But, um, but believe it or not, there was a curator of the trees there as well. And so he could probably give you that answer. Probably thousands, but they, yeah. come from, they come from all over. And some of them are older than the cemetery, existing trees. Um, so yeah, you know, that's the kind of thing you might be able to go on their website and find out about. In the back there. Are there any lots available in my office? There are. There are. I'm, I'm not putting on it, you know, this is not a promotional um, lecture. But yes, Mount Auburn Cemetery is still available. They have a lot of unique um, options today, sort of shared memorials. They've kind of realized that they don't have enough room to put in a memorial for every single person. So they're putting in more shared memorials. Um, so that it keeps the landscape beautiful but still allows people to be buried there. So for example, in one area they put in like a, a beautiful granite um, curbing, sort of a wall thing, and they were able to get, you know, they were able to get a lot of names in there without marring the landscape. Yes? Is it uh, li li uh, limited to one specific religious denomination? Or no, denomination? that's a great question. If those of you in the back didn't hear, they asked if Mount Auburn um, is limited to a type of religious denomination, and no, it has always been non-denominational. Yeah. So um, you said that um, the cemeteries prior to Mount Auburn yes. uh, were more like Graveyards. Graveyards and, and weren't maintained. What is the date where there's a change in that overall? So for those of you in the back who may not have heard the question, um, Susan was wondering where you see that change from the really burial ground, unkempt burial ground, to the beautifully landscaped cemetery. Um, in the United States, it's Mount Auburn Cemetery, 1831. That's it. That, this is where it started. Mount Auburn Cemetery took their influence from Père Lachaise, in Paris, France, and that was founded um, a couple years earlier. So they were pulling, they were pulling um, inspiration from another cemetery in France. Um, but in the United States, it started with Mount Auburn Cemetery. Yeah, but, but my question really was, mm -hmm. did other cemeteries or did other burial grounds pick up that tradition afterwards, and about when did that change? Yes, so the, the question was, well, did, did other burial grounds pick up the tradition? Yes, it was an immediate success. Within several years, you have like many Mount Auburns popping up all over the United <coughs> States. Um, usually they chose different names, but some of them are called Mount, Mount Auburn as well in other parts of the United States. But yeah, just within a couple of years, it didn't take very long for it to catch on. And I think people were really ready for this because we didn't have any sort of um, park system, and so these really function not only as burial grounds, but also as parks. Um, Mount Auburn Cemetery went in before we had the Boston, um, not the public garden, but the, um, I'm sorry, Boston, Pub I didn't mean to say Boston Public Garden, right, right, Boston, uh, the common was much earlier, but Boston Public Garden, I think, didn't go in until 1837 or 1839 or something. Uh, in the back, you, yeah. So yeah, so the um, so there's not a direct connection. They really just took um, they took um, the knowledge of the day. So information was coming over through publications, through photographs, not photographs, through drawings. Um, and so, as far as I know, nobody actually went over to Père Lachaise, and nobody from Père Lachaise actually came to Mount Auburn Cemetery. Um, but they were definitely inspired by it, and were able to get that information through published. On um, means. Yeah. Yeah. When did the tower go up? So Washington Tower, I would have to look that one up. I don't have the date in my notes. Um, but I believe that was near or after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In front. Uh, the as a very raised or just depending on how much money you had. 
Um, uh, my big goodies, which is huge. There is a red check. Well, what's these small stuff? Right, so somebody in the... So somebody in the front is asking a question about, um, or it's probably more of a comment, because you're absolutely right that the gravestones often reflect the socioeconomic status of the people being buried there. So uh, he brought up Mary Baker Eddy has a very large temple on the lake um, that took quite a while to um, construct. Um, so yeah, so often Mary Baker Eddy is interred at Mount Auburn Cemetery. Yes, uh, I didn't show you um, an image of it today, but she is there. Yes, yep. in the back. Um, since those were fairly large plots, were they recorded with the Registry of Deeds? No, not that I know of, because they were private nonprofit. Um, the question was, were these lots registered as deeds uh, with the Registry of Deeds? And no. So the cemetery as a whole was its own entity, and so you were buying something from this private corporation. Um, so the state didn't really get involved with, with the deeds. Awesome. Susie? What kind of supportive staff is needed to keep these enormous... Uh, huge. Uh, huge. <laughs> huge <laughs> staff. Yeah, there's a huge staff. There's, there's administration staff. There was collection staff. There was um, monument care staff. There is the um, seasonal um, workers who you know, cut the grass and mulch the leaves, and um, yeah, so there was, there's, oh, there's, if you go there, you'll see staff members driving around in the little cars, there's security. Um, when I was there, we even had a dog on staff. His, his name was Alpha, and he scared the, the Canadian geese away. So, um, yeah, so we, I mean, when I was there, there was probably, oh gosh, and we were all in different buildings, too, so... You know, we would take big staff photos. There must have been at least 60 people in the, in the staff photos. Yeah, good Thank question. It, was there a question in the back? So the funding for that staff. That's, that's the funding for what? The, the uh, maintenance and the landscape and all that. Where does that... Uh... That's a great question. Where does the money come from to, to maintain Mount Auburn Cemetery? So when I first told you that people bought lots, they were responsible for taking care of their own lot. The cemetery quickly realized that this was not a good idea because once everybody sort of maybe moved away or everybody in that family line died out, there was nobody to take care of it. So they started something called perpetual care and it's an extra additional charge um, when, you, when you would purchase a lot in the 19th century. Um, you would have to buy perpetual care for the grass. Other people would opt to buy perpetual care to have plantings put in. Like this is a lot with perpetual care. So these people might have died 150 years ago, but they paid to have the lot um, have flowers put in every year. So they have to, on the back of that lot card I showed you, is the perpetual care contract. And the cemetery is responsible um, for making sure that they're keeping up with these perpetual care contracts. Um, they also have an endowment and they do a lot of fundraising. Any other questions? Uh, okay, in the front here. When they um, do care for the property and, and all the horticulture there, mm -hmm. do they save the clippings? <laughs> yeah, Mount Auburn is very green. I'm, it's just it's just amazing. Things that you see coming around now, they've been doing for like 20 years. I mean, they were mulching, um, composting, you know, from a very long time. They're very green. Um, yeah, so they have sort of, you know, you they have sort of like a dump area too where they mulch the different things. And what's also interesting is you see people collecting them. So if it's fallen off of a tree, it's fair game. So you would see a lot of people collecting the ginkgo, the ginkgo fruits to make different medicines out of it. And so, yeah, so you can go there and you can maybe forage for dandelion leaves or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's allowed. Yeah. Do we have a question over on the side? Yeah, I just wanted to know who was buried in lot number one. <laughs> yes, I should have written that down. Um, I know it was a small child. Oh. It was a small. It was a. It was a very young child who was who was buried there. But in those books that you see that they published, that that's always in the guidebooks. Is the the first lot. So I can I kind of see the picture in my mind, but I don't see the name. John. Yeah, did you have any idea roughly how many other Wellesley residents might be out there, or was it just the ones with Boston connections? I, I don't know. Like I said, I sat there. They have this online database where you can go and see if somebody's buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery. 
And I literally, you gave me a list, and I got lists of like famous people from Wellesley, and I just sat there for hours just plugging names in. Um, so until the system, I mean, I don't know that they really record people's hometowns necessarily. It, you know, I don't even know if that would even be possible in the future to search their database that way. But for now, we have to just sort of do it the old-fashioned way. I just sort of have to walk by and either recognize a name or look at a name in the database. So, yes? The Egyptian Sphinx? Yes. So the Sphinx was actually designed by Jacob Bigelow, one of the founders of the cemetery. That was put in, that was a memorial um, to the Civil War. So around that time period. Question in the back. I just have a, <clears throat> a statement. Uh, is to, I wondered if Mount Auburn, uh, we have a large lot at Forest Hills, which mm -hmm. is fashion after this. Yes. And there's about 35 places left. Mm -hmm. There's only four of us left. Yeah. <laughs> so we asked about selling it. I wondered if Mount Auburn does the same thing. The only way you could sell, sell them is they buy them back for what you pay for them. Mm -hmm which in the 1800s was $300. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I don't, if, if these, there's a lot of these family lots that have plenty of room left in them at Mount Auburn Cemetery. So they're, what Mount Auburn Cemetery is doing to create um, more burial space, and I mentioned the, um, the shared memorials, but what they're really doing to create more space is a lot of the paths, some of the paths or things that used to be roads, they're closing them down and creating burial space there. Yeah, but I think, you know, I think, um, I don't know that they've ever sold unused space in lots. I don't think that would even be allowed. Yeah. I'm sorry? Columbarium. Right, somebody just mentioned the columbariums are also a, um, another um, Interment option at Mount Auburn Cemetery, which are above. Well, columbariums are for interred remains, um, not not interred, cremated remains, um, and then we also have the crypts, which are above ground um, sites as well. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. coffee, there's water, there's cookies, and I know Kathleen will be here if you have other specific questions for you, for her, which I suspect some of you may. So thank you very much for coming on this beautiful It was good.